Hello. Uh, in this video, what we will now discuss is the risk allocation in project finance cash flows or essentially considerations with respect to risk allocation of projects using project finance. Okay. So we discussed that there are several types of projects which can be project financed. And these are the projects that are usually um, financed using project finance. Uh, in our previous discussion, we discussed that these projects are usually uh, projects that are standalone in nature, meaning there is only one asset class, one asset type. And that asset has a specific output. And that output will be the source of the cash flows that will be used to finance the project or to pay off the loans of the project. So actually, project finance started with the first type, first line there, which is conventional pipelines or, or, or uh, gas pipelines. If you can imagine what a gas, uh, gas pipeline is, basically, it's just a big pipe between two areas. The areas where pr production is made, kung saan yung planta, then there's a pipe connecting it to the area where it is going to be distributed. No, so as a project as simple as that was the first type of projects that were project financed because it's very simple. There's only one kind of asset no, with only one purpose, which is to transport gas from point A to point B. And what is the cash flows relating to that? The cash flows relating to that is the agreement between point A and point B on what will be the, the revenue mechanism for that. So that kind of project is a classic project finance type of project where it's very simple. The activity is very simple. Build a pipe you know, and then use the pipe to transport gas from point A to point B and someone will have to pay for that service for the pipe for the pipe uh, or for the transmission service between plant A and plant B. So that's one of the more um, uh, that's one of the more easy type of project finance. And it becomes more and more complex. Okay, So oil fields and oil mines can be project financed also. Power plants and hydroelectric power plants. Now, if you imagine in a power plant, so tayo ka ng power plant and then the objective is for you to generate electricity. That electricity of power plants to a generation plants, meaning they don't connect directly to consumers, right? They sell it to the electric distributor. So if you look at it, there is only one of taker there. There is only one party who is um, going to uh, purchase the generated power and that's Peralco, the you know, electric distributor. So you can have an agreement between the owner of the power plant and Meralco on how much power does he really need. So therefore it reduces the risk and therefore more um, applicable for project financing. Some of the more most complex types of project financing are telecom projects, toll roads, mass transit, and water and sanitation projects. The main reason is that these projects usually are not, the, the output of these projects usually are not sold to just only one customer. Usually, they are sold to the public, say toll roads, right? In toll roads, and income from toll roads or revenue from toll roads will really come from the number of vehicles using the toll road. And because there are so many, um, so many people or, or, or vehicles who can use this, okay, there is one risk that is very prevalent in these two, in telecoms and water. What is that risk? No, that risk is with respect to demand risk. So subject to ng fluctuation of demand. Unlike yung power plant, kasi pwede ka makipag, you can you can contract or you can talk to Meralco and ask Meralco how much are you going to buy in advance, and therefore you can produce based on the agreement with Meralco. Okay, so bahala na si Meralco how Meralco will distribute it. 
But for water and sanitation or telecommunication projects, you are liaising or you are, you are doing business directly with the consumers. And you cannot control the demand of the, of the consumers, right? And therefore, uh, these projects are a little bit more complicated to do via project finance because market risk is now in the picture you know, and may influence you know, and may, may cause fluctuations in uh, revenues. So that's why this is a very important continuum. Um, okay? The least complex projects usually have one of taker. Isa lang ang kausap mo for revenues and therefore you can pre-agree on how big is his demand. Okay? That's the case for power plants, for oil fields and mines, and for conventional gas pipelines. Kung magkano lang, kung gano'ng karami lang volume ang kailangan mo, yun lang ay bubuin ko. And therefore, you have to assure, assure me of that volume so that I will only build that big of a pipeline. Okay? And makes project finance a little bit easier. Versus water and sanitation, it depends on gano'ng karami ang konsum konsumo ng mga tao which you cannot predict. Okay, you can forecast it, but it won't be 100% accurate, which makes cash flows a little bit more volatile, which makes project finance a little bit more difficult. Okay. So in the previous video, we showed the different parties in the project finance deal. So what we'll do in the next few slides is to define some of these items so that we have a common language. Okay. So when we talk about the sponsor, the sponsor is the promoter and the equity investor in a project finance deal. So, um, ang sinabing sponsor, siya yung equity owner in the SPV and will provide the necessary capital for the project. Okay? Usually, there are three types of um, sponsors. One is an industrial sponsor, technical and financial sponsor. The industrial sponsor is the lead. No? In, in a project, there could be several equity owners. But if you're the lender, you have to understand, oh, sino magpapatakbo nito? Who will be key management? Okay? And usually, the equity investor which appoints the CEO, which is basically the general management of the project or of the company, no? those sponsors are the industrial sponsors because they will put in the work to make sure that everyone will do its share or everyone will do its uh, work and deliver the project. What are technical partners or te technical sponsors? Technical sponsors are the equity owners that are bringing in the technical expertise so that the project will continue. No? So let's look at a project, for example, by San Miguel. One project by San Miguel is the Bulacan Bulk Water Project. Okay? So it's a water project that uh, treats water, gets water from Angat, treats the water and sells it to the 20 plus water districts in the province of Bulacan. So activity ng project, get water from Angat, treat the water, build pipelines, and distribute the treated water to 23 or 22 ata municipalities and cities in Bulacan. Okay. So that consortium is between Korea Water and uh, San Miguel Corporation. San Miguel is the industrial sponsor because he's the lead. He's managing the whole thing. Okay. Okay. The technical partner, because they are bringing in the technology, they're bringing in the water expertise. San Miguel does not have a water project before this. They don't have a water business before this, okay, or a formal business that is similar to the project. So they need to bring in someone from Korea okay, to, um, to be their technical partner to make sure that brings necessary expertise to the whole project. So. That's the nature of a technical sponsor. A financial sponsor naman bring, goes in and provides equity at, in, with the main objective of investing money and at, and at a later part, cashing in that money. So these are usually your investment banks or funds that would like to participate 
in PPP projects or project finance projects. So their objective is really to, to, to bring money into the picture. And of course, with the expectation that they'll earn money, they will earn money later. So the SPV, as we have previously discussed, is the special purpose vehicle. So it's the entity, which is the vehicle where the assets and financing of a project are encapsulated. It is a separate and distinct entity from the sponsors. Okay. And again, the objective of putting a project in an SPV is to um, limit the risk of the project within the entity. And at the same time, isolate risks you know, and use the SPV as a way to allocate risk between different parties. Okay. A plant contractor is the company that wins the tender for the design, construction of a given plant. Okay. So the plant contractor is the one who is the, is the technical person who will build the plant based on the specifications that's required. Okay. Usually it's in a fixed price, fixed date basis or a fixed price, fixed date turnkey contract. So for fixed price, it's a BN, is on price. It's not a cost plus price. The contractor has to um, quote me a fixed price for it. Okay. Then fixed date, what we mix a BN on fixed date. It means that there's a specific date that it has to be finished. Okay. And turnkey contract. What is a turnkey contract? Okay. If you imagine the word turnkey, it means it delivers sa akin ng contractor yung planta. Ito turn ko na lang yung key gagana na. Okay. So the deliverable of the contractor in this case is for them to design the plant, build the plant, commission the plant, and deliver it to me in a working condition, ready for operations. Okay. So in a turnkey contract, sometimes this is called an EPC contract or an engineering procurement construction contract. It's a contract in which a company is given full responsibility you know, to plan and build something so that the client, which is the SPV, can use it as soon as it is finished without any work needed. Okay. So of course, um, there's a main contractor it is uh, normally responsible for damages resulting from delays in completing the facilities. And if there's delay, you can also, the SPV can also uh, require penalty fees from the contractor. We'll discuss more of that in the next slides. The OMM operator, on the other hand, is the counterparty who takes over the plant from the contractor after the construction phase is complete. Okay, so in the Bulacan backwater plant, for example, this is all, all, only an example. Um, it could be the case you know, that um, a certain company is the plant contractor. Once the plant is um, turned over to the SPV, the SPV then hires a separate company to serve as the O&M operator of the plant that he owns. Because they have to manage sa iba. Okay. Imagine, say, in the hotel industry, this is also a, a um, usual uh, activity. No? In, the, in, the, in the real estate or in, the, in, the, in, in hotels, no? um, also that you hire a hotel management company to manage the hotel that you built. And it's something similar to that. So now, once the contractor turns over the plan to me as the SPV, I can in turn hire someone else to operate it on my behalf. Okay. Why would I want to do that? Because number one, I may not have, I might not have the expertise to do the O&M operations myself. And number two, it's also a risk management mechanism. Hindi ako magaling mag O&M operator eh. So, ang pwede kong gawin, I can ask someone na alam po mas magaling kaysa sa akin to operate it on my behalf. And at the same time, I'm passing on the risks to him because he has to guarantee that, the, that he is running the plant efficiently and it is in keeping with pre-established output parameters. Now, if pumalpak siya on his operations, he will be penalized. Okay? So, 
it, 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 that relationship is usually governed by an ONM agreement or a technical services agreement. Okay? So again, the appointment of an ONM operator is a way to manage risks of the SPD, right? Di naman expert ang San Miguel sa pag-operate ng bulk water. So it might make sense for him to hire another company to operate the plant in his behalf. Okay? And that's allowed. No, I mean, banks would um, recognize that. Another party is the ONM, uh, the off-takers. So when we say off-taker, these are the counterparties to whom the SPV sells its output. Okay. In the Bulacan Bulk Project, the off-takers are the different water districts within the province of Bulacan. Okay. So the buyers of these goods and services um, might be generic. It could be a single buyer. In the case of Bulacan Bulk, it is multiple buyers, but a set, set number, which is 20 plus. Okay. Their relationship are governed by a purchase agreement or an off-take agreement. In the agreement, what is usually included, usually there are provisions called take or pay provisions. What are your take or pay provisions? Take or pay provisions are contracts wherein you pre-agree on the amount that the counterparty will be buying from you. Okay? So for example, Water District A has agreed to buy from me 8 million liters of water per day. Okay? Under a take or pay provision, he's required to take 8 million liters per, per day. Okay. If he takes less than 8 million, I don't care he pays 8 million anyway. Because he has committed 8 million waters per day, um, 8 million liters per day. So he has no choice but to buy 8 million liters of water from me every day. Now, if he actually takes just a portion of it, it doesn't matter. He has to pay eight million per day. So in that case, risk has been allocated, right? Risk has been transferred from the SPV to the off taker. Because the demand risk no wala na. and that's one way to mitigate risks of the SPV. There are also suppliers. No, so companies might have supply input to the SPV to run the plant in the basis of long-term contracts, which include arrangement for transporting and stocking of materials. So usually there are supply agreements. Okay? Um, in the water sector, when in Pulacan Park, probably there's no significant supply agreement, probably only in terms of um, chemicals. You know, that's a very important supply. And probably there could be supply agreements between um, chemical suppliers and the company or the SPV, wherein they are assuring me of supply at a pre specified price. Okay. So there are different strategies in dealing with risk. So the company may retain the risks that it is seeing, no? it may transfer the risk by allocating it to counterparties. Then you do it by signing EPC contracts, signing ONM agreements, signing uh, supply agreements or offtake agreements. But in those agreements, you are able to allocate risks to those counterparties who are best able to control or manage the risk. And last is you can transfer the risk to professional agents such as insurers. Okay. There are several types of risks in projects in general. So we will be discussing each one. No, not in detail, but at least give you a um, a good idea no, of how this is are managed. Risks can be um, classified into three. One is pre-completion risk or risks that are inherent before a plant is, is uh, completed. Another classification is post-completion risks, risks that are present after the completion of a plant of the facility. And last is risks present in both phases, you know, pre and post completion. So I won't go through the risks now, but we will discuss each one in the foregoing slides. So what's the base, what are the basic principles of risk allocation? Okay. First basic principle, risks must be allocated 
to the counterparties best able to bear and manage them. The SPV might not be the best party to manage risk. No? And because it is not the best party who is equipped, who is knowledgeable to bear and manage the risk, the impact of the risk might be magnified because they're not experts on managing it. So what's the best way to manage it? The best way to manage it, manage it it's probably hire someone or allocate those risks to agreements to a counterparty and let them handle the risk for you. Okay? Later, we will have numerous examples of how that risk, those risks may be allocated to different counterparties. Basic principle number two, second basic principle is that if it is not possible to find a counterparty that accepts to bear that risk, the risk can be transferred to insurance or insurers. Okay? So insurers um, bear some risks that are very difficult to mitigate. For example, fire, arson, right? So those are risks that no one will be willing to take. But since insurers are so diversified in the risks that they handle, you know, they may be able to, um, to bear that risk and therefore probably just buy an insurance policy to cover for it. Next, basic principle three, do not consider only one risk at a time. The combination of effects can offset risk. So there could be cash flow self-protection. We'll discuss more of this later in the examples. Okay. Now let's discuss pre-completion risk. A very significant pre-completion risk is construction risk. Okay. Um, everything can go wrong in construction and it may make or break a project. Okay. Kasi pwede hindi mabuo yung project eh. And if the plant is not completed, then lenders will be screwed. Okay. Because they have given the money and with no other means to recoup it. That's why construction risk is very critical to banks. Because they are giving the funding during construction. And the biggest risk for them during that time is if construction will not be finished, where, how will I get my money back? I think once the plant is up and running, at least makakahinga na ng maluwag ang banko. Right? Because they can always say na, okay, at least it's, it's working. The plant is working. And there could be... Um, that is working and eventually they will earn the money so that they will have enough to get to service there. Okay. Specific areas or issues with respect to construction risks are three. First is cost overrun. So when you say cost overrun, um, exceeding the budget. Okay. Second is completion delay or abandonment, meaning hindi matapos because or delayed ang um, construction. Third is meeting project specifications. You have a plant within budget. You have a plant that was delivered on time, but it's not able to do project specifications, meaning hindi malinis ang tubig na lumalabas. On time nga, within budget, pero hindi nagagawa yung dapat niyang gawin. Okay? So, those are some of the significant risks in terms of construction risks. How, how do you control that okay first in terms of cost overrun we control that by contracting a fixed price turnkey construction contract because it is fixed price okay there is no cost overrun risk or very limited cost overrun risk okay so if papasa mo ngayon yung cost overrun sa epc contractor okay you'll tell the epc epc contractor na basta meron na kong planta 10 billion pesos I don't care how much you spend to build it as long as it's 10 billion pesos for me. Kung makatipid ka, kita mo na yun. And therefore, the risk of cost overrun and the rewards of cost savings also is now transferred from the sponsor to the EPC contractor. Okay? So, that's one way to, to transfer that risk. Okay. Next, 
um, completion guarantee. You will require a completion guarantee from this point, from the contractor. Okay. You'll also require progress reports so that you know that something is happening. Okay. One way also to manage uh, cost overrun risk is for the contractor to take junior debt and or equity stake in the operations. Okay. Kung, may, kung yung contractor mayroong equity ownership rin, then he will ensure you know, that costs will be uh, under control. Why? Because he is also the owner of a company. Okay. In terms of the risk of completion delay or abandonment, again, you have to make sure that your EPC contract is fixed date. It's a fixed date construction contract. And there will be penalty payments and performance bonds for any delay. So in this case, you are now, again, transferring the risk from the sponsor to the EPC contractor. Kasi sino ang mapipinalize pag may delay? Hindi ako, hindi SPD. It's the EPC contractor. And that penalty should be commensurate to the penalty that I may be incurring you know, because of this delay. Kasi pwedeng meron akong commitment sa government. The government may penalize me for the delay. And since I transferred that risk to the APC contractor, that same amount of penalty must be charged to the APC contractor para zero effect in the SPV. Okay? Next, meeting project specifications. You have to require performance tests for commissioning. And commissioning, there, is, there should be no acceptance, no payment without commissioning. Of course, you use proven technology. And there should be a wrap around guarantee that the whole, the whole all components of the project together will deliver the project specification. So that's a wrap around guarantee. And you, you, you set that through the EPC contract. So the EPC contractor is the account, the person accountable, you know, one step accountable for the detailed design, procurement, and construction of the plan. The contractor bears the risk of delayed completion, post overruns, and underperformance. So the EPC contract covers responsibility of the main contractor towards subcontractors. It will usually um, exclude outside the fence works, for example, connecting to pipelines, connecting to grid, because it's not there. They cannot manage the risk. The EPC contractor also isn't responsible for technology efficiency license by a third party to the SPV, meaning, um, meaning if if a technology is forced upon by the SPV to the APC contractor, of course, they cannot be held responsible for it. And usually construction permit and authorizations are outside the scope of the contract. Because again, they cannot control that risk. Although sometimes it's better to include it, you know, since um, usually these contractors have relationships with permittees and uh, government authorities since madalas silang may transactions. So it could be part of a contract, but definitely um, these construction companies won't guarantee you know, that permits will be uh, issued on time. So that has to be considered also. Um, again, the APC contractor cannot be deemed responsible for forced major risks, of course, war, civil unrest, they cannot control that. Okay. And there could be liquidated damages, which is equivalent to the um, penalties you know, that uh, you are exacting to the EPC contractor because of um, delays. Okay. Um, what are other? Okay. Another risk category is third party risk or interconnection risk. Okay. What are the risks that you want to control? You want to control the contractor's dependency on third-party suppliers okay? and project dependency on third-party projects. How do you control this? For contractor's dependency on third-party suppliers, there has to be incentive mechanisms to keep the timetable. 
So, for example, one is to provide a bonus for early delivery. Okay. So, if there's a bonus for early delivery, then contractors will be motivated to make sure that their third-party suppliers deliver on time. Okay. So, also another method of control is for for contractors good is to check these contractors good relationships and experience with third parties. Okay. Post completion, the main risk are operations risks, okay, or operating risk. For operational risk, what are the risks to be controlled? First is unsatisfactory plant performance. Okay. Second is inefficiency and cost overrun again. And third is natural hazards and disasters. Okay. How do you control this? For unsatisfactory plant performance, um, usually okay, we will require the EPC contractor to have a warranty on the plant. Iba the deliver the plant sa atin. At sinabi niya that it's turnkey. And because it is turnkey, he is saying that it is um it will work and will provide the proper um, supply or proper output. So therefore, through performance guarantees or warranties by the EPC contractor, then we are able to transfer the risk from us to, from us to, um, to the EPC contractor. For operating inefficiency and cost overrun, Usually, it is covered by an own by an ONM agreement, okay? and we are now transferring the risk from the sponsor to the ONM contractor. Okay? Next is natural hazards and disasters that's usually covered by insurance. Okay? Another kind of risk post completion is market risk. Okay? So market risk simply means um, there could be no buyers of my output. Okay. So one way to manage that output you know, is to have off-take agreements. So if the product or service is sold to one buyer, off-taking agreements may be necessary. Okay. So long-term sales contracts are the ones signed. So the buyer is obliged to buy a specified quantity and the price is already set on the market. And there could be contracts for differences or derivatives when the product is sold on the spot market, but the off-taker pays cash in the difference when the price is lower or higher than the agreed price. So this is um, this is like a derivative. Okay. Now the problem with market risk is that market risk cannot be usually cannot be transferred in projects as projects or services are sold on an open market to end users like water, like telecommunications, it's very difficult to manage market risks that way. Okay. Although there are certain methodologies that could be used. Okay. So for example, one way to manage market risk is um, the concept of shadow tolling in toll road projects. Okay. So what's shadow tolling? By, by the way, this... Um, this methodology is not present in the Philippines. This is an Australia concept, okay? Shadow tolling in road, in road projects simply means you know, that <clears throat> the government, you know, so a shadow toll payment mechanism for the project would entail the state or the government paying the concessionaire service payments you know, calculated based on the number and type of vehicles using the road in a payment period, okay? In other words, um, the government will be counting the number of vehicles that are using the expressway. And the government will pay you know, only to the extent you know, that uh, the number of vehicles that, that, it, that is necessary so that the company can cover debt, subordinated debt and variable operating costs and dividends. Okay. So as the number of vehicles increases, the level of the shadow toll also increases. Okay. And it gives some assurances to the lenders that they are going to be paid. You know? 
because it will definitely cover senior debt service. Okay, so if the number of vehicles are very, very low, there could be a shadow toll still okay, for them to cover senior debt service and OEM costs. Okay. And as it goes up, you know, of course, the level of the shadow toll also increases. You know, but at some point, it won't be paid anymore. Another way to manage market risk is simply to change the structure of the project. Okay. So, for example, I'm looking at an, a terminal project, intermodal concession. So, intermodal simply means terminal, bus terminal. Okay. So, in a bus terminal, for example, there are two, you can collect fees from the buses, right? Okay. Collect fees from the buses. If you collect this from the buses, there's market risk there. It depends kung ilang bus ang dadaan. Right? One way to change the, um, or manage the market risk is to change the structure in the project to make it availability payments based and rather than fee based. In an availability payment structure, you know, the state identifies that it is paying a concession fee for making a service available. Okay, so, magbabayad siya ng availability payment to the concessionaire, which is the private sector in this case. So that the private sector will earn something. You know, and that's a payment for the service of the concessionaire for making the terminal available for use. And then what happens to man is that the buses will pay the government for the use of the terminal, which in effect it is leasing from the concessionaire. So in that case, from the point of view of the project, the risk is now fixed, diba? rather than market-driven. Okay? What are your market risk? Why? Because the government is paying me fixed payments rather than me getting my revenues from the buses. So from market risk, no longer market risk because the market risk was assumed by government. For post-completion risk, we are, these are some other risks to consider, okay? Supply risk, of course, okay? How do you control supply risk? Through fuel supply contracts and having contingencies, okay? Transportation risk, you might have long-term transportation contracts so that you can control blockade, strikes, slowdowns, and cost escalations. Other post-completion risks are financial risk, interest rate, and inflation. So how do you do that? Mm, you can have an interest rate hedge to control. Inflation risk, you can also have pass that on. So pricing lock-ins with the bank. Okay. Political risk can also be controlled through political risk insurance. So I think the key message of this um, presentation is that in a project, there are a lot of risks to be considered. Okay? And as we have previously discussed, those risks must be removed from the SPV so that banks will be willing to loan or to lend the S to the SPV on a project finance basis, non-recourse. You can only do that by having a web or a network of contracts okay. that will transfer the risk out of the SPV to other parties and making the cash flows of the SPV predictable and um, less risky. And with that, project finance can thrive. Okay. After all of this, what we will see you know, is the presence of a risk allocation matrix. What's a risk allocation matrix? In this area, you, know, you see the different parties in the project finance deal, SPV, contractor, tech supplier, operator, etc. Okay. Here you see the different risks. Okay. The idea is these risks are allocated to specific parties 
in the whole project finance transaction. Okay, so that if you look at the line special purpose vehicle, these are the residual risks being retained by the SPV. All other risks were transferred to other parties. And because risks were transferred to other parties, we expect that the cash flows with respect to those risks will be less risky and therefore more predictable and therefore more um, palatable for project financing. Okay. So that's it. That's the end of our presentation. This is just a an overview. We don't intend to discuss this in detail, and I think we will be looking at it in more detail through the two cases that we are going to discuss with respect to project finance. Okay, thank you.